Good morning, Resonate. Let's try that again. Good morning, Resonate. Good morning. How are we doing? Yeah, thank you. It is so good to see you today. This song that we're going to start off with is called Goodness. And when we think about goodness, we should definitely be thinking about the Lord. I have a couple scriptures that I want to read to you. Exodus 34, 6 says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. And this one, especially as we sing, we want you to stand. Go ahead and stand with us. Ezra 3.11 says this, and they sang responsive, not responsibly, they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever toward Israel. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.
many are thankful for his goodness this morning? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Are we doing good? Nice. We got a nice good morning up here. I'm glad to see everybody here today. Is my microphone on? I think so. Is it on? It's on. All right. Hey, everybody. Glad to see you today. Uh, we just want to say welcome to all of you, especially if you are visiting with us here today. A special welcome to you. I'm going to ask you to do this again because we're going to do this every week. If you can, if you are visiting with us, we want to get to know you a little bit better. And hopefully you want to get to know us a little bit better. So there is a card outside here. There's a welcome desk right out there. If you want to just fill out that card, we'll send you a welcome letter. And because you filled out that card, we'll just send you a free gift certificate to Mocha Moment just for, just for saying thanks uh, to filling out that card. All it is is just kind of you getting to know us and us to getting you know a little bit better. That's all it is, all right? So if you are visiting with us, if you could fill that out, that would be great. Uh, secondly, uh, we are Resonate. We also all often say this. Resonate simply means to be filled with a deep sound that you can go reverberate it out. So that's what our goal is while you are here. Feel the spirit while you are here. Hopefully, by the way you talk to people, but more so the way that you encounter the spirit. And then you can go out to your community, wherever you are, and share the good news of Christ, all right? So that's who we are. Uh, there are a lot of different small groups we always advertise here. So if you are visiting with us, we have a ton of life that goes on here, any kind of small groups. From what I hear, we have one small group that shouldn't be called small group anymore, from what I understand, um, on Monday night. So if you're just looking for a community for your family, I probably shouldn't do this because he's going to get mad at me, but Monday night at Hoyt's house, there is a good group of people that are there with family, um, so we would love, what's that? Oh, there's food there. That's why there's people. What? What? What time? What time? What time? 6.30. All right. So they should get there by like 6 if they want food, though. No, I'm just kidding. Food. So they have they have lots of free, good, delicious food. They'll feed you and they'll give you some Jesus. Man, I think you want to be there. All right. So Monday night, uh, 2425 Hickory Court, West Hickory Court. All right. Um, it would be great for you if you can't make it face to face. There's a link on our Facebook page where you can go up there on Zoom. But uh, great community happens there. They talk about Jesus. They build community amongst a group of people. So I would highly recommend Monday night. And if you can't make Monday night, we got lots of groups that happen here during the week. So check it out. We definitely believe in community here. Um, lastly, I just want to say this. Over the next two weeks or so, please watch your calendar. It will be on a Tuesday. We're going to have a men's night again. Uh, we're going to bring back our men's night. So basically that's just going to be for you as a guy. If you would like to invite someone or just come and meet some of the Resonate men, that would be awesome. But very non-threatening time for you to eat together. And then uh, we just hang out and, and talk. All right. So keep your eyes out for that on Tuesday night. We'll be doing that in the next couple of weeks. All right. Uh, so I don't really think I have much more than that. So I'm going to pray. Actually, I do. I do. One more. Hey, um, this, is, this is not me coming to you uh, pleading from the stage, but I am. Um, our children's ministry is, is growing a lot, all right? Um, and we need people to help. In fact, we would love to be able to separate two of our age groups um, because they're j it's just growing, and that's a really good problem to have here. But in order to be able to split the age groups, we need more volunteers, all right? So if you can even just volunteer once a month, that would help us a ton. And we're not asking you to teach. We're just kind of asking you to hang out with kids, show them Jesus, introduce them to Jesus, and just be there to be alongside our leaders that are down there already. If you can do that, all right, even just once a month, we will be so thankful. Because, like I said, our numbers down there are just in a good way, they're just doubling, tripling, whatever you want to call it, which is a really good thing. So what's that? Sign up sheet? Sign up sheet. Oh, yeah, I didn't set that up. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, si we'll, we'll send you a link this week also on Facebook or in your email. Um, we have something called Sign Up Genius, so that way all you got to do is basically go on your phone when you get here on Sunday morning, sign in your kids so we know what kids we have here and such so we can be a little bit more safe. 
all right? So, but again, my plea is going to be for you, if you can, all right, even once a month, if you're an adult here and you're just saying, hey, you know what, I like to call Resonate my church home, um, we would love for you to get involved here. Just put your name, I think there should be a sign-up sheet out there, and we'll, we'll follow up with you and, and do some things with you, but we would so greatly appreciate it because it's a good problem to have, but it's kind of where we're at right now, all right? Hey, I'm going to... I'm going to pray, and then, because I think you're singing a song about praying. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. All right. So let's, let's pray together. Father, you are worthy of our praises. God, you are the reason that we are here. God, we pray as we are here this morning, as we've just kind of went through some announcements, and we're about to sing some more songs God, I pray again, as we pray this often, that we are not just going through the motions as we're here this morning. God, we know that you are an active God, that you are present in our everyday life. So God, we know that you are here right now, and we want to give you all the glory, but Father, we also want to greet you while you are here. So Father, I pray for each soul, each person here in this place. Father, even if they're listening online, God, may they fully meet you here today. May they encounter you maybe in a way that they haven't encountered you before. God, we're here for you. We want a personal relationship with you. God, we hear about that all the time, but God, we we want a personal relationship with you where we can be knowing you ever more every single day, where we can connect with you. God, the fears and the troubles of this world, God, that we can just truly and trustfully come to you with these concerns. God, let today be an ignition to our rest of the week that we spend with you. God, we're asking, will you please greet us here? In your name we pray. Amen. You can stay seated during this um, song. Um, How many of you know that this Thursday coming up is National Day of Prayer? Raise your hand if you know that this Thursday is kind of labeled as National Day of Prayer in, in our nation. And our, our nation definitely needs prayer. Last year, before the National Day of Prayer, I wrote this song called So Pray. And the idea behind this song is, is we go through very anxious moments, some uh, worse than others because of whatever circumstances that you may be facing. Um, and there are some people in here that have faced uh, circumstances that we can't imagine even even empathizing with. We can sympathize, but we can't empathize because we haven't been through those struggles that are a reality uh, in your life. Everybody is unique in their situation. Um, So as I sing this song, really pay attention to the words. Um, Allow these words to speak to your heart this morning. If you're struggling with anxiousness and and understanding uh, God's sovereignty, then listen to the words of this song as we uh, prepare uh, for the message. Thanks. 
God is faithful to not forsake us. He'll never leave you alone. The Lord is near to all who call on Him. Oh, so close. Father, we just ask that you would just, Lord, be with us today as we continue on our music set. God, we thank you for all that you do. God, if there are those who are struggling in their walk, struggling with anxiety and anxiousness, God, we pray that we would do exactly that, is go to you in prayer, to the author of our salvation. God, we give you praise. In your name we pray. Let it be said of us, go ahead and stand with us. While we walked among the living, let it be said of us. By the ones we leave behind, let it be said of us. That we live to be a blessing for life. Let it be said of us that we came to reach the dying. Let it be said of us by the fruit we leave behind. Let it be said of us that a legacy is blessing for life. Let it be said of us 
that our heritage is blessing for life. This day, this day, you said life, you said death right before us. This day. When you move, I'll move, I will follow. All your ways are good, all your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone, higher than my sight. I will trust in you alone, in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. When you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life, I'll to my life I will live for you alone you're the one I see knowing I will find all I need for you alone in you alone where you go I'll go where you stay You serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Yeah, in you there's life everlasting. In you there's freedom for my soul. Where you stay, I'll stay. 
When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. In this life, I lose. I will follow you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I'll love. Who you serve, I'll serve. In this life, I lose. I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are and for all that you've done for us. Lord, we ask that you would just speak to our hearts today, Lord, that we would commit ourselves to following you in your ways. Lord, to dig into your word, to know who you are and what you have for us. God, we pray, Lord, as Jesse brings forth the message today, as the three questions are brought to us, God, that we would focus our hearts and our minds this morning on you. And Lord, we give you the praise. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. I don't know. These are not uh, hats. <laughs> Just, just so you know. We're going to pass these, these things around. Uh, if you're visiting with us, please consider that they may be hats because you don't really need to put anything in them, all right? Uh, people that regularly attend here, you guys know what's for. This is our, our return of blessing into God the Father for what he's going to do in our community and outside of our community. So uh, let's pray. God, thank you so much for the blessings that you have given us. You're an amazing God. I, it's, it just stuns me. It knocks me down how glorious and how great you are. But yeah, how far you'll reach down to bless us, your people. God, in, the, in our degradation, you show us your glory and you show us your love. It's amazing what you do. God, I pray you'll take these offerings that we give unto you, that you would multiply them for your purposes and your purposes alone, that everything we do will redound to your prosperity and not our own, that your kingdom, big K kingdom, would grow. God, you're an amazing God and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we come to a time where we, we, we call this time three questions, and as y'all know, we call it three questions because we ask three, three questions. questions, thank you. And the questions are really simple, they're made so that, so that you can do these at home, you can do them at work, you can do them with friends, you can do them in the park, it makes it so you don't have to have a Bible study that you have to follow, stuff like that. Um, so we hope that you learn these things and you can, you can ask these questions of any text, it works with any text and it allows you to, to really dig in to see what God is teaching you. Uh, because God has blessed you with the same Holy Spirit that he's blessed Jesse with, that he's blessed me with. That same Holy Spirit, he is God, he is one. So therefore he communicates to you. You're able to handle God's word in the same way that I can handle God's word. Nothing special about me, I promise. All right? So we ask these three questions. They're very simple. They are, what does this passage teach me about God? Because you can't know anything about anything until you know something about God. Second question, what does this passage teach me about myself and my community? Third question, how am I going to apply these things to my life, right? So the question is very simple. What does it teach me about God? What does it teach me about myself, my community? How do I apply it to life, all right? So that's, those are those three questions are very simple. This passage that we're going to do today is in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 26. It is a parallel passage to where Jesse is, is preaching from momentarily, uh, or however long y'all talk. I guess it is. So here's the passage, and then it will be turned over to you guys. It says, And he said to all, it's red, so that means we know who the he is, right? That's Jesus. And Jesus said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. All right? So there is the passage, very short, very brief. They're going to continue to scroll it so that you guys can continue to look at it and pull stuff out of the passage. But now it's up to you. What does this passage teach me about God? Your turn. 
Yes. Okay, so God wants us to follow Him, not the other spirits of the world. I'm, I'm trying to re, re, you know, capitulate, you know, put that out. So follow Him, not the other spirits of the world, so that you have something of Him, can I say it like that, something of Him to then take into the world, right, to deliver. So He wants His, his word, His joy to go out into the world, so He wants you to follow Him instead of the things of the world. That way the stuff that you take into the world are His things, not the world's things. All right, so what else does this teach you about God? The world is upside down compared to God. So there, there is a plan. I don't know why this came to mind, but uh, if you know much about our solar system, there's one planet that's on its side. Anybody know? Oh, you're nodding your head. It's your, it's, and I'm going to say this properly so y'all don't laugh. Uranus. All right? So uh, it's actually uh, it's on its side. And so instead of spinning like this as it goes around, it looks like a ball that just continues to tumble as it goes. It's on its side. It's upside down. Well, our world is also upside down. God knows that he, he created the world properly. He knocked it off his hinges at the flood, so it's, it is a little bit slanted. The world is upside down. We tend to follow the world instead of following God. God knows that, so he has a plan for us. What else does this teach us about God? Yes. God is our everything. Is there anything that, God, that you need that God does, cannot uh, provide? No, God has everything. God can provide everything. He's our everything. What else? God is able to save what we lose. Does anybody have one of those things that you find your, your phone with or your, you know, the beep, 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 beep? What? Dob does? Well, he has to have one. I'm, think, I'm thinking Sharon has one for her keys because she always loses it. Uh, there's, there ha what are those things called? Tile. That's right. Tile. Right? You lose your stuff, you hit the button, and it finds it. God's even better at that. God can find what you lose, right? You lose your life, God will find it for you. You lose your life, God is able to find it for you. What else does it teach you about God? God is waiting. He's patient. Not like we count patience, right? But he's waiting. He's long-suffering, waiting for you to come. God shows patience to you. What else should it teach you about God? Yep. He has his holy angels. You know, the word, the word angel means messenger. That's what the word means. It means messengers. So he has his holy messengers that he sends and he talks, he, he does things. God has power and he communicates through, through different sources. What else does it teach you about God? God has a plan for you. Oh, wait, here's one too. God what? He's coming again in glory. God is coming again in glory. That's a very small voice that I hear sometimes from the chair, by the way. If so we have one person on, uh, on, on, on Zoom with us because for some reasons. But anyway, God is coming again in glory. What else? God has a kingdom and it's real. It's not just make-believe. It is real. It exists now, and it will exist in the future. It is real. What else teaches about God? All right, so I'm going to sum up your story here. God is awesome. He, is, he has all the power. He has everything. I know. He has everything that you would ever need. He is our everything. He has a kingdom. He has power. He has angels with which he can send messages. He sends messages to you and he wants you to take those things that he gives you so that you can take stuff into the world because the world is upside down. The world thinks that the world is primary as opposed to God being primary. So he wants you to understand that that he has something for the world, that if you'll take what he gives and take it into the world, it will change the world. Those things that were lost that you think would never be able to be recaptured again, God can find them. Peace, tranquility, grace, long-suffering, patience, because he will wait us out. He will wait because he knows that he can find the things that you lost. I think that was everybody. All right, so uh, question number two. 
Here's question number two to you. What does, oh, uh, sorry, and he is coming again to, to, to get rid of, I'm sorry, I looked down at Ching Hong, I looked at everybody else, but I forgot Ching Hong Lee. So God is coming again so that if, if we don't take the message to the world, God is going to take care of it at the end to initiate his kingdom. All right, now, question number two, what does this teach you about yourself and your community? What does this teach you about you? Yeah, so if you're counting, if you're doing a profit, profit and loss statement, right, uh, if you're doing pros and cons, it's better for you to lose here and profit in eternality um, than to profit here and lose out in eternality. Your, your, your balance sheet is going to be way, way on the profit side uh, if, you, if you give up the stuff here and give to the Lord. What else teach you about yourself, your community? We should be happy because God has provided for us. We should be happy because God has provided for us. He gives us stuff. It doesn't matter. It's not an accumulation game. Who, who, he who dies with the most toys wins. It's, it's, it's the things that God has given you. That's what you take joy in. All right? What else does teach you about uh, yourself your community? Yeah, so... We need to expand our profit margin. We're going down an account. It must be tax, you know, tax time already passed. No, they extended tax time to next week, right? Yeah. So we need to extend our profit margin by extending um, uh, our, our, the grace that God gives us, you know, the bank account of God's grace into the community uh, so that there's a difference. I was trying to come up with this, some sort of PPP that I could, that I could make that. Uh, into a Christian type of thing, you know, a godly PPP. Um, but anyway, so we need to share God's message, share the grace that God's given us in the community. What else teaches us about ourselves and our community? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not a, I think I will incorporate God into my life. I think sometimes we fail at that, right? We say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add God into my life. I'm going to add him in. It's not, that's not what it is. God said, and, and Jonathan said guillotine. So, you know, pick up, pick up your cross. You realize that the cross, the cross was never meant for punishment. They never punished people on a cross. They only killed people on a cross. So when he says take up your cross, it doesn't mean take up your hardship. It doesn't mean take up your, your, your burden. It doesn't mean anything other than take up your instrument of death. I'm going to give my life. It's a radical transformation. It's a radical gift that you're going to give to the Lord Jesus Christ to say, I give you my life. You gave, you gave your physical life. I give you my life. Uh, I get to have your spiritual life for, etern for eternity. All right, radical. What else does it teach about yourself or your community? Yep. Okay, be happy for what you have. Uh, and I'm just going to say that's enough because that's, you know, what God has given you, that's what he's chosen to give you. Be, be joyous about what he's given you. Whether, and I'm not talking about material stuff. I'm talking about your, your mental capacity, your, your physical health capacity. Be joyous that God has given you something because he's crafted you uniquely to take that profit margin of grace out into the community because there's other people who are like you, who are similar to you, that your gospel message and the grace that God showed you can, can speak to them in the same way. You have access to people that I don't have access to, that Jesse doesn't have, that other people don't have access to because of the unique way God has created you. So take joy in what God has given you. Take joy in the way he's created you. Don't say, I wish I was like that. Man, if I was just like that, I could, boy, what I could do if I was like that. No. Think if you were like that, the people that you would miss because you missed your own calling and the people that God called you to, right? What else does teach you about yourself, your community? Oh, yeah, that's all the more better. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, so there's a uh, geek out just a little bit. The, the, the equation for finding your, a sum at the end of, end of a period of time is P-E-R-T, PERT, right? But you're, what you're doing is you're making an investment. Your principal, then you multiply that by some rate of increase over time. So whenever you make an investment in people, however big that principal is, it will grow at a certain rate. The longer time you have and the, the more intensity that rate is, the bigger the, bigger the, the end balance of that account that JT was talking about, you know, the, your account that you're, you're spreading. So if you put in a big principal, i.e. a large amount of time, large, large amount of effort, and then God is the one f- that's responsible for the increase, there's your rate of return, and you stay with them for an extended period of time, you're going to have a huge balance at the end. All right? So people are investments. Don't look at something on a one-day span. I understand that people are investments. I saw you sort of like halfway raised your hand, so I'm going to get you. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, what would Jesus do? So on a daily basis, asking yourself, what would Jesus do in this moment? What would Jesus do? Constant, you know, consistently uh, representing who Christ is and the things that he did, the things that he said, the way he, he acted, his patience, his long-suffering, his grace, his mercy. Is that where you... Okay. So making sure that you live that out. Now, I'm going to chastise y'all just for a minute because i got to get one thing in. Because y'all have... I, I, it's very noticeable to me. Y'all skip something. I mean, there's a... He says it over and over again. Do not be... Thank you, ashamed. Do not be ashamed. All right, so I'm just going to throw this one in for free since y'all missed it. All right. <clears throat> so you can't be ashamed of his gospel. He says it multiple times in the scripture, and I'm sorry, this is, you know, if, it's, if it's stepping on your toes, pick your feet up because here comes the foot. So don't be ashamed of the gospel. He says, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. In another place, he says, if you deny me in front of, in, in front of your brothers, in front of other people, I will deny you in heaven. Depart from me. I never knew you. See, it doesn't matter if you know Jesus. It matters if he knows you. Okay? Oh, I know God, but does he know you? That's the question. Don't be ashamed of those things. We cannot be ashamed of that in our community. We can't be ashamed of it in our own lives. All right? Anything else? So here is your story. I'm going to start off with mine. All right, so uh, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed. Make sure that you're, you're able to willingly pull into your bank account of love and faith and pull out you know, some story that you can tell people around you because it's about our community. That's what Jesus did. That's what we should also do. The more time and the more effort you put into the people around you in your community and your family, that is an investment. You're not losing stuff. You're gaining stuff. Right? So eventually, even though you may not see changes immediately, give it some time. God's long-suffering, so can you be long-suffering. And if you allow these things to continue to grow, God will work out his plan in the midst of it because he's called you to those things, and that's where he wants you to work. I'm cutting that one short because I already went long, and I feel some heat coming from eyeballs over here. So, all right. So, third question. Third question. How are you going to apply these things to your life? What are you going to do? Start these off, please, with I will. I will. I will speak the name of Jesus boldly, unashamedly, and often, right? And I will, I, I, I will hide God's word in my heart so the things that I say I will, will come from God's word. Something like that, right? I will, I will what? I will not be ashamed when he comes and gives me his glory. I will not be ashamed. I will not be ashamed. What else? I will? I will invest, I will invest in others' lives. I will? I will seek Jesus, I will seek Jesus, and I will say, not the world. I will? I will share Jesus with the people that I meet. I will? I will follow you. Yes. I will not be ashamed of praying for my sins. I like that one. I will? Woo! I will invest in others and not respect anything back. God's kingdom investment right there, baby. All right. What else? I will. Anyone? 
Half, a half of one. I will follow Jesus. I like that. Yeah. Awesome. If you are a child, you may now exit into the back for our Res Kids Children's Ministry. And then uh, if you're staying in here, which I'm hoping the majority of the rest of you will, we're going to open up to the book of Matthew, chapter 10. All right, so if you have your Bibles, that would be awesome. Hey, I this. if you have your Bibles, we, we study the ESV here at this church, the English Standard Version. So I just want to put this out there. We, we would love for you to get into a practice of, of opening up the actual Word of God like this, okay? If, you know, if you have a device, that's okay, but we like getting into the practice of opening the Word of God, okay? So if you have your Bible, bring it with you on Sunday mornings, but we are in the process of trying to get some ESVs here at church if you don't have one. But again, we would, we would love, 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 love to see these books brought, the, the Bibles brought by all of you here uh, to the church so you can get in the practice of opening these up because if you aren't doing it here at church, you're more than likely not doing it at home. I'm just going to be honest with you, you know? So um, that's kind of what our goal is for that. All right? So Matthew chapter 10 is where we're at. Let's uh, begin in a word of prayer, and then we'll get going. Father, you are so good. We thank you for your word. Father, I pray as, as we open it up today, God, it may be a message that's going to step on some toes, as, as Hoyt said before. But Father, I pray your grace is always sufficient for us. And so, Father, I, get, I, I pray for ears to hear, and I pray for minds that are, are ready to hear your word this morning. God, give us peace to know that you are in control. You haven't lost control, nor should we doubt you. But God, you were here yesterday. You are here with us now, and you are ready in tomorrow. Let us never, ever forget that. God, we, we love you. We trust you. Take our time here together. In your name we pray. Amen. So I'm just going to jump right into Matthew chapter 10 today. Um, my, my son yesterday was walking around his bedroom, and uh, suddenly, you know, having two three-year-olds in your house at the same time is not always the easiest, you know, because you, you want to hear talking a lot, but with two three-year-olds, almost, you know, four-year-olds, and you got another little one under that, you know, like, you hear a lot of whining and crying a lot, you know? So as a parent, you try to tune some out sometimes. I'm not that insensitive parent, so don't judge me, all right? But sometimes you just try to, like, tone it out a little bit, you know, so yesterday one of them starts whining and crying, and I'm like, oh, man, here we go, right, and, and he's crying a lot, and you get that, okay, are you hurt, are you seriously hurt, well, my son had stubbed his toe on his bed, right, and everybody hates stubbing their toe, and, and, and you kind of look at him, and you're like, man, why did you do that, you know, like, what happened, what was sitting out, and as you walk into his bedroom, you know, you see the toys sitting all over the floor, and you see things all sitting out, and you're kind of like the dad, kind of sitting there like, I probably shouldn't say this, but you're kind of thinking, well, if you'd put your toys away, this probably wouldn't have happened, right? If you understood correctly that uh, if you put these things away, you probably, this probably wouldn't have happened. Um, that's kind of what I felt yesterday, but trying to be sensitive about it, you know, so, hey, buddy, maybe next time you should put your toys away, you know, and, and give it a little smirk, but here's where we're at today. We're going to look at a passage, and for most of us, we're going to read it, and, and just that one verse, it's going gonna, it's gonna to turn you a little bit, so as we read it, stay with me, all right, Matthew chapter 10, and we're look at verse 34. This is Jesus. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. This is like going to be the main verse that we're looking at here today. And I know many of you are, are sitting there, whether you're going to admit it out loud right now or not, or maybe it's just sitting in your mind, you're sitting there, well, that's not the Jesus I understand. You know, like, 
Isn't it from way back in the Old Testament? I mean, doesn't it say that, that Jesus, I mean, in, in, in Isaiah, when it describes Jesus when he comes, I mean, doesn't it, doesn't it say that one of his names are going to be the Prince of Peace? You know, like, wait, wait a minute, that doesn't make much sense to me. I mean, wasn't the angels uh, singing around his birth? Weren't they saying, in, uh, and on earth, goodwill towards men, you know, peace uh, to people, and on earth, peace? You know, like, so in a way, isn't this kind of confusing? And I would say, maybe, if you had a misunderstanding of what kind of peace Jesus is talking about here. So what we have to kind of work through here this morning first is talking about what kind of peace Jesus is is not talking about and what kind of peace he is talking about because he says here I'm not coming to bring peace to the earth I have come to bring not come to bring peace but I've come to bring a sword so we got to look first of all at what kind of peace he's not talking about he's coming into first of all I'm just going to get this out there because it's probably the best way you're going to understand this. If you think that Jesus has come to the earth to bring some kind of like beauty pageant kind of peace, you know, like every beauty pageant, they walk up there, "What what do you hope for someday? World peace. You know, like that is, well, that's what Jesus is saying. That is not what I'm after here. What, What is this kind of peace in the world that we're talking about? Where everything is easy where everything runs smoothly, where everyone loves everybody, where love is just love, where what you wish or what you dream, you can be that or you can do that. Where when this Jesus would come, that he's going to wave this Son of God flag, the Son of God card, and, and suddenly every run around him would suddenly say, oh, Jesus is here. Bow down at his feet, and let's just stop what we're doing. Because he's supposed to be the king, so we should just follow him. See, we think that's odd to say stuff like that, but most of the time when we talk about this peace, this is what we think about. When we think that Jesus was supposed to come into the world and bring peace, we're like, well, well, this is the peace that he's, they're talking about. You know, like Jesus is supposed to come here and, and ma- wave his magic wand and everything was supposed to go perfectly here on earth. And, and Jesus says, I've not come to bring peace but a sword. So breaking news for you, Jesus didn't come for that world beauty pageant peace. See, peace in Jesus means not harmony on earth, but peace with God. Peace in Jesus means not harmony on earth, but peace with God. I'm going to read a couple verses here for you. John 14, 27 says, peace I leave with you. Jesus says, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. You seeing that? See, Jesus isn't about world peace. He's about peace in his Father, peace in God. So he's saying, I'm not going to bring you this crazy world peace. I'm leaving with you the peace of my Father. Verse, second one, John 16, 33. I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. You seeing that? He says, in, in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with who? With, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so you got to see that. Jesus is saying, I am not coming here to bring world peace. I'm not coming here to bring earthly peace. I am coming here to bring a Sword, Because all of these verses that I just read for you, they're talking about different than what the world is going to provide you. 
He's promising you. He's guaranteeing you. He's predicting that you are going to face persecution because you are after the peace of God, not the peace of earth. So he's saying, I am bringing a sword. I am bringing different than what this world is going to provide you. So as you're sitting here today, what are you fighting for the most? Are you fighting for world peace the most? Is that what you seem to desire and want the most? Is, is for, you know, everybody to get along? For why can't this, everything just go well? Is that what your main thing right now is, is the peace of the world? Because Jesus would say, that's not what I've come for. He's saying, I have come that you may have peace and complete peace in my Father. So he's saying, I'm not bringing that world peace, I'm bringing a sword. What does that look like? We say this often here, and I've, I'm, I'm, I'm praying that you get this point. Jesus is saying here, I am, I am coming here to declare war <laughs> on the world. I mean, if, if a sword doesn't say that to you, like, that's a, that's a fighting, like, instrument, right? A sword is, it's, a, it's, it's an instrument you would use in a battle. So Jesus is saying, I'm not coming to bring this world peace. I'm coming to start a battle. You seeing that? What else does that mean? He's saying, I've, I've come to divide and conquer. He's saying the sword is going to bring forth strife, Conflict and division. Check out what he says in the next couple of verses. Verse 35. He says, For I have not come to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother. Excuse me. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Woo. Jesus, that's, uh, that's pretty personal. That's pretty personal what you're talking about here. You see, Jesus is saying, even in your family, there may be a battle. And that battle is world versus Jesus. See, thank God that we have families here that stay together and pray together. I love that, that, that Pastor Tim said and sang a song saying, let's, let's pray together. I mean, there's tons of verses that say if, if my people were just to get on their knees and pray, he would, he would heal the land. In other words, if you would seek after my peace instead of the world peace, that's what it would be. But sadly... Valuing this in families is not how it always goes here. In many families, in many families, there are some who choose Jesus and to follow Christ in faith. And to be bluntly honest, there are children or fathers or mothers who just choose not to follow Jesus. And that creates strife, and that creates division within the family. You don't need to raise your hand, but are any of you with me there? I want to read a story for you. This is about a, a young, young gal, a young adult who was raised Muslim, and somebody had shared the message of the gospel with her, and uh, someone did an interview with her about what had happened. You want to talk about division, here it is. This is what it says. I had read and even written articles about persecution before, but this turned out to be something much more than a headline in the paper. I didn't think about her being nervous, but when I walked into Sister E's office, I could plainly see that she was. She took several deep breaths, and I was clueless about her anxiety. With my pen and paper in hand, I plunged in and immediately asked, what did your family say and do to you when they discovered you had a new faith in Jesus Christ? She was stunned. She lifted her eyebrows, her eyes bulged out of her head, and she, her mouth opened. 
and her head dropped and slowly shook from side to side. The silence spoke volumes. My own insensitivity was overwhelming. She was going to relive the hardest time of her life, and I hadn't even offered her so much as a glass of water. When her eyes finally looked at me, her face was wrinkled in pain. With scars I would never comprehend, she gathered herself, took another deep breath, and said, My mother found out first. And with a blood curdling scream, she said, Infidel, infidel, infidel. She slapped me and she sent me to my room. When my father got home, I was, again sla- I was again slapped, and he also spit on me. He shouted, you are no longer my daughter. Go to your room. She says, that's where I stayed for for three years. E stopped in the middle of the next sentence, and tears dropped from her chin. She couldn't go on, and I hugged her. I attempted to tell her I was sorry, but I had no frame of reference for understanding her suffering. I needed to be better prepared. I needed to comprehend this harsh reaction reaction from her parents so I could show even a teaspoon of compassion. Promising to come back later, I left to do more research. I read other people's stories. I searched the web, and I asked countless questions. Here's what I learned. Listen to this. In the most radical Muslim families, a convert is locked in a room and given three days to return to Islam. If they refuse, they are slaughtered. If they escape... They will be hunted by family for years. If children are involved, when a husband comes to Jesus, they are considered bastards because they no longer have a Muslim father. They are either given to another family member or they are killed. In a less religious family, the convert may be taken to uh, Amman, who may lead the family to the beating of the believer. If the convert is a woman, her family may force her to marry a Muslim cousin to avoid shame and scandal. Many have been restrained with ropes, burned with acid or hot oil, and subjected to electric shocks. Sometimes families commit converts to mental institutions, thinking that leaving Islam is a sign of insanity. Others are forced to leave the home, family, and the community they know. You know, um, I'm sharing this story. I'm going to actually ask Hoyt if he wants to share any kind of stories that he has maybe personally faced, because I don't know if you know this, but he goes all over the world, and he gets these stories all the time. But I, I want you to see that Jesus is saying, I- inside your families, <laughs> I, I'm not just bringing peace. It may be a sword that divides your family. So, yeah, And there are people actually on screen now and I know on Facebook as well that are currently suffering under similar conditions. Jesse asked me to share a story. Um, so just one, there's a man named, his name is Kantharo Misala. Uh, you, some of you have met his youngest son, his name is Sastri Misala, and he's come here before. Uh, Kantharo, uh, who, whom I call Nana, he's a great friend of mine, uh, he was the first believer out of his village, and this is in India. Uh, he was in a fisherman village, and he was the first first convert in that in that village. Uh, when he became a believer, his father immediately um, cast him out. Well, not immediately. They took him out to fish and tried to drown him. But then after he came back to shore, then he, he threw him out of the family. Uh, Kantharo uh, went out, left uh, with his wife, who was already his wife at that point. She tried to leave as well. Uh, he had to hunt her down, find her, bring her back. Uh, he went back into the village where, where he'd been cast out. They broke his leg. They drug him out into the ditch and put him in the, in the rice paddies. Someone pulled him back out. He continued, he continued. Um, he's, uh, he still walks with a limp. Both legs have been broken. His arms have been broken. His collarbone has been broken. Jaw has been broken. Multiple, multiple different situations like that. But I, I want to get to the end, sort of a, a farther end of the story because I want to draw together part of what Jesus, uh, Jesse was talking about here. Uh, he never fought back. And so some of the questions as I ask, you know, what, what do you feel in the moment? And, you know, Jesus said, I came to bring sword. He said, he said the, sword, the sword is his word. I'm never able to use that sword back to the people. He gives me peace 
those people are striking me, but I can't ever strike back. He said the division that, that's caused between brother and brother, father and son, it's always on their side that the division is, never on my side. I can't cause the division. The division is theirs. It is not mine. And so he, his, his desire is always to go back and go back and go back, step forward, This is because this is 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 60 years ago. Step forward about 40 years, 40 years, his brother came to Christ. Mm. Uh, for the next 18 years, his brother has served by his side in a church planting movement that we've now seen 5,000 churches planted in the last four years. His brother is one of the main, main leaders of that. His brother just passed away this fall. Uh, and now that brother's children, are uh, three boys are also pastors. His whole family ended up, almost all of his family, almost all of his immediate family, ended up coming to Christ. His wife's entire family came to Christ because he was long-suffering and patient and never willing to take the sword to them. He allowed the division always to be on their side, not on his side. So God did come to bring a sword. That sword is his word, the word of the gospel. Right? He knows that there's going to be division. He built, he built into this the fact that there's going to be division because we have an enemy. We're not the enemy. Jesus is not the enemy. The enemy is on the other side. Allow them to be full of hate. Allow them to be full of vitriol. We bring the gospel of Jesus Christ, which will look like foolishness to the lost, which will smell like death to the people that don't understand, but it is the life of Jesus Christ, and it's his gospel that, that will eventually bring peace to people. All right, so there's a story. Thank you. Yeah. So I wanted him to share that with you because I wanted you to get an idea. You know, like there is some serious persecution going on, right? But I, I, I also want to be bluntly honest with you. If you have children and you are here at this church or you have brothers or sisters or a father or mother that, that don't follow the Lord, it is extremely difficult. I mean, that, I, I, I want to be sensitive to that, you know, because I have family members that are the same way. It is, it is, is, this is a very sensitive subject here. And even as a pastor... You know, I've, I've had to sit with people in my office and, and, and just see tears falling down their eyes of, and down their faces of, of why in the world will, will they not choose Jesus? Or, you know, like I've raised them in the church. Why do they not, why do they abandon their faith when they go out by their own? And they take a ton of blame and it is on their part. But as Hoyt said, it's, it's, a, it's a battle against the enemy. It's something you've got to understand here. I, I want to talk to those that may be a wife out here whose husband refuses to go to church with her and hear the word of God, vice versa. You see, it's a source of pain over time that becomes a dull ache and it's still there, and it still lingers, and it keeps going. Why would, why would Jesus do this? Why would he say that I'm going to be dividing families, and it simply is because of this one thing? The love of God and his kingdom must take precedence over every human relationship. And that's going to be really hard for some of us to read. The love of God and his kingdom must take precedence over every other human relationship. Why would the lady that I read about, why would, grew up as a Muslim, knew what would happen to her if she made a decision? Why would she do that? Why would the, the, the man that Hoyt talked about, knowing the brutal punishment that's going to come to him, why would he choose to do that? Because he knows that the gospel is the greatest message and the greatest story of saving and salvation that could ever be in this world, better than anything could offer. As Hoyt said before in three questions, he recognized that the message of eterni eternal is better than getting stuff in this world. But you have to see that the love of God and his kingdom must take precedence over every other human relationship. So I just want to start really, really quickly, talk about 
having a correct understanding of the battle. I'm just going to ask really quickly questions that maybe you're asking here today. First of all, why do people refuse the free gift of salvation and grace? And this is a simple answer for me, and we've talked about this a lot. Because they love the darkness, and they don't want to be exposed by light. This is John chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that uh, it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. You've seen that? They refuse salvation. They refuse grace because they love the darkness. That's why some people refuse the free gift of grace and salvation. And unfortunately, that may be one of your children. That may be a parent. That may be an uncle, an aunt, a, a, a grandma, a grandpa, a cousin, a niece, and maybe your co-worker, someone that you really, really care about. Why do they continuously refuse that free gift of grace and simply because they love the darkness. Second question, why do people despise me or why do they despise you for being someone that believes? (laughs) Because you are a breathing, living demonstration of someone that knows that they have a problem. You hearing that? They know that you are a breathing demonstration, a living demonstration that you know that you have a problem and you can't fix it yourself. You see, this is what our world is all about. I mean, you are an admitted sinner, right? And you admit that you need a Savior. People of this world don't want to admit that they have a problem. And even more than that, people rarely want someone else's help. They want their own solutions. They want to discover the solution all on their own. People don't want to hear what they do or want to do may be considered wrong or a sin according to God. They don't want to hear that. That's why they despise you. See, Romans, in the book of Romans chapter 1, it talks about this huge problem that they're facing, the Romans are facing. You know what it is? They love the things God created far more than they love the creator himself. They're worshiping the created things rather than the creator himself. So these created things, they're finding other ways to worship and do stuff with it. So they find a way to boot out the creator and worship the things that he began to create for good. Third question, why can't we all just get along? You ever ask yourself that question? Because the world does. You know, I I started preparing this message, and I wrote that question down. I said, that's like a simple, dumb question. But do you know how many times the Lord had me see that bumper sticker that has that coexist on there? This week alone, I can't tell you how many times I saw that bumper sticker. Listen to these two verses. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18 says, For the word of the cross is folly or foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In other words, to some people, that message that Jesus is the only way, that's complete foolishness. Some people preach there's a ton of ways to get to God, right? There can't be just one way. So it's foolishness when you preach about the cross. You, it, it's foolishness when you say Jesus is the only way, truth, and the life. That salvation only comes through Jesus alone. It's foolishness to them. But to you that are being saved, it's the power of God. That's why you can't get along. That's two different things that are completely contradicting each other. The second one I have in here is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are being perishing or are are perishing. You seeing that? You're the aroma of God. You you stink like Jesus. But listen to this. To one, you are a fragrance from death to death. To the other, you are a fragrance from life to life. In other words, to some, you stinky. You stink because all they think of is death here 
and I'm going to death. To others, you smell like life. You have that sweet aroma of Jesus. You have that sweet aroma of joy, peace, patience, kindness. You have that sweet aroma. So they look at you and they smell you and they be like, what, you, what is that fragrance you got there? Where are you shopping? Let me get some of that. You seeing the difference? That's why we can't get along. Fourthly, though, another duh question. Why can't we have both? Why can't we have both? I'm going to bring you to two passages really quick. This is Joshua. He's all the way back in the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 24. See, the Israelites were flirting with the Egyptian gods and with God Yahweh. And, and, and here's what Joshua said. He said, now therefore, Joshua 24, 14, 15, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes, if you find that following God, then the message of God is, is all about something that you want to make it about and it's not true to you. But he says that if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of, the fa- of your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, he says, we will serve the Lord. Choose this day, he says. Are you going to serve the gods of the land that, you know, you brought back from Egypt? Or are you going to choose Yahweh, the one that got you out of Egypt? That's what Joshua says. But Elijah, same thing happens in 1 Kings chapter 18. They're here again, and they're praying to this God named, you're going to either say Baal or Baal, or there's a whole bunch of different things, right? Right? He's basically the God of rain, and they want it to rain. So they're praying to this God. And they're saying, well, can't we have some of him and still serve Yahweh? And here's what Elijah says in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. How long, I love this, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if it's Baal, then follow him. See, both of these passages from the Old Testament are about the Israelites being unable or unwilling to make a choice. They want to hedge their bets, they want to sit on the fence, and they want to keep their options open. But both Joshua and Elijah, and I can also say that I believe Jesus is saying the same thing, that not making a choice is making a choice. You want both? You're choosing that one. Not making a choice to serve God and find God and, and just saying, well, can't we kind of have both? I'm not going to make that full. Ch- I'm literally like, it's kind of like going into the water. I'm just going to dip my toes in there a little bit. Test, Ooh, that's cold. And back out and then say, well, I'll go back over here for a little while, right? He's saying, no, no. You want it? You're all in. Because I've not come to bring peace, but I've come to bring a sword. So Jesus is commanding you to wake up. Wake up and serve and join him or stay in the darkness and join the world and their fall. I'm going to share one more story with you and then we're going to be done. In 2017, there was a university in uh, Oklahoma. And uh, here's what I'm meaning by kind of going on the fence. There's this university in Oklahoma, and it's a public government university, right? So they come to them. They got these people that are coming to them, and they say, hey, we want uh, separation of church and state, right? So in the midst of your small little university, you have this one building that's called a chapel, right? And inside this chapel, you know, you, we have services and all that kind of stuff. But these people saying, because of fairness, right, and because this is a government property, we need you to remove the cross from the steeple because it's degrading to some people. So trying to appease both, you know, like, well, we want Christians to come to our university, but we also want others to come to the university. They, they succumb to it, right? And they take down their cross. And all of you are like, why would you do that, right? Well, they were thinking, 
you know, we're not all, we're not going to be all in because then think of what's going to happen to the people that might come from the world. They're not going to come here anymore, right? Think of the ridicule and the punishment and, and all the different stuff we might get if we don't do that. So they weighed the options and they said, well, I think it would be better if we did that. So they did. And you know what happened? Not even a year later, the same group that rose this to say you now need to remove your cross, they said, hey, now inside your chapel, to help even more with discrimination and such, we need you to remove the Bibles and the crosses inside the chapel. You see, y'all, if you give them a step in, they're going to take it all. And if you're not ready to stand for what you believe, you're not in. The, you're not in. Because he's, he's saying here, Jesus is saying here, you're not supposed to get along perfectly with the world. So I need you to do something for me. As you're contemplating what you heard today, I want you to do something really quickly. I want you to sense your need to pray. I want you to hear that. I want you to sense your need to pray. One, pray for yourself in your battle, but two, pray for our nation and our world. It's a battleground, people. Pray for your family, your friends. You know, like, man, I'm sharing this gospel message. Pray that, that, that God would do something because that, that lady that knew the punishment and persecution coming, she didn't do it because of the message that someone gave her. She did it by the power of God alone. So start praying for them. But two, sense the urgency. Jesus is talking to his disciples and saying, there, you need to sense this urgency. I love the passage in Jude. You guys hear me this talk about this a lot. I love it when he says, snatch others from the fire. Sense that urgency that you are going in the, to rescue people from the fire and snatch them out. Sense the urgency there. Sense the urgency that there's not much time left. You know? What happens if one of those loved ones that we talked about before just randomly had some serious accident? You are going to be on your knees and being like, man, why didn't I say something? Sense the urgency. Sense the seriousness here. You can't have both. Serve one and you despise the other. Sense the seriousness here, what God is saying. But fourthly, sense the call. You know, many of us think that Jesus is telling us to stand up and fight. But that's not what he's saying here. He's the one that's bringing the sword. He's not asking you to be the judger of sin. He's asking you to make a decision and to stand on it. And stand on the word of God. Are you for him or are you against him? Are you running or as Elijah said, are you limping in both? You cannot have both. Why do we come here on Sunday mornings? Why do we do that? Because we know that the power of God and we know that greater is the one who is in me than he who is in the world. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. Because the power of God is far more than the power of this world. And if you believe that, start standing like it. Father, I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you that even in the midst of disaster and disgusting and grossness, that you are still saving lives. That, Father, even in the midst of America seeming to go off completely off the grid and, and giving themselves to everything, God, you have not stopped reaching and loving and giving yourself for people here in this world. So, God, I, I pray that we continuously become people that are standing on the word of God. Not what we think, not what we think you would say, not what you might do, but God, we are firmly standing on what your word says. 
Because you are bringing that sword. You are bringing the word of God. You are bringing your holy breath to us. So God, help us be those bearers of that sword. And the only way we're going to do that is if we spend time with you in your word. So Father, help us get to know that sword. If we're supposed to be standing on it, having most confidence and the most peace in it, how are we going to do that if we aren't getting to know that sword? So Father, I pray for strength among these people. Pay for strength among those that are maybe listening online or, or, or hear this somehow. God, we desire to have strength and peace in you and in you alone. That's why we're here. So help us to stop fighting for world peace, maybe, Father, and help us to fight for the peace of God. Amen. Psalms 27, 13 says, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Let's stand and sing about his goodness this morning. never fails me in all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God in all my life you have been faithful In all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God all my life in all my life you have been faithful In all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after me your goodness is running after, it's running after me. If my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. In all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing 
of the goodness of God. Hey, I'm going to ask you just to sing the chorus one more time in a minute. I'm going to read Romans chapter 1, verse 16 for you. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you ashamed to be called the son of the Most High? Are you ashamed to be called heirs of his in this broken and depraved world? Don't be ashamed. But the other thing I just wanted to mention here in this verse, it says, all my life you have been faithful. And some of you may be singing those words or reading those words and saying, nah, I don't know about that. You know what? God is in tomorrow already. So what you may view as peace today, know that he's already there tomorrow to show you that he's not lost control, that he's still got it. So you can sing this chorus faithfully, saying, I can have this peace because you are faithful, because you're already there tomorrow. You have it all worked out. You know everything that's going to happen, and that's where my source of peace is going to come from. So... We're going to sing this chorus one more time. But I want you to remember that, that my peace does not come from this world, but my peace comes from the word of God and from the power of God. And as you sing this chorus one more time, sing it confidently to know that all your life he is going to be faithful. And that's what you can trust. Let's sing it together. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Let's sing that acapella, just the voices in all my life you have been faithful. In all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Pray with me, and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for you and your presence and your power. And we pray that it is our desire to serve you and to continually praise you for all the things that you've done and for the things that you haven't done that you will according to your promises. And I pray that as we go out into our communities and we interact with those that we love and maybe those that we don't even know, that we'd be confident and not ashamed of the gospel and that be, we'd be willing to share um, the big story, which is your grace finding us in our lowest moments and giving us um, a new effort to strive for something greater, which is you, more of you. I pray that you'll continually um, bring us into that place of desire, that we continually strive after you, and that you'd be the focus in our lives because we love you. We praise you, Lord. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a good week.